Hello, everyone. My name is Danielle Page. I'm an intern ranger here at Big Cypress National Preserve. I am originally from New Hampshire, came down here to avoid the cold. It doesn't seem to be working this week, but we've been good so far. Um, and when I was in New Hampshire, I went to Plymouth State University, which is just outside of the White Mountain National Forest, which you might have heard because of our beautiful foliage in the fall. And while I was at university, I got my degree in uh, my bachelor's degree in sustainability and business management. And during college, I was fortunate enough to travel around Latin America and Western Europe. I studied abroad in Argentina, Costa Rica, as well as uh, in Spain. But when the borders closed in 2020, I decided to explore the US a bit more. And that's how I was introduced to the National Park Service. So my first national park ever was actually just this past summer. It was Yosemite National Park down here in the bottom right corner. And these are some of my dream parks. So my goals for the future are to work seasonally for the National Park Service as an interpretation park ranger, changing parks every six months. And if you see a theme among these parks, your eyes are not deceiving you. I am in love with mountains and somehow I ended up in Florida where the elevation does not exceed 400 but here, but hopefully in the future, I get to work at places like Olympic National Park in the top right corner, the Grand Tetons in the bottom right, as well as Yosemite National Park. But for now, I work here at Big Cypress National Preserve, and I work in the education department. So what that means is I get to lead field trips out in the swamp. So every sixth grader in Collier County has the opportunity to come out to the swamp for the day on a field trip. And they're little scientists for that day. So they have a backpack, you can see in the left picture, um, that brown backpack there, and that's full of all their equipment they need to conduct experiments. So we study the hydrosphere, the atmosphere, as well as the geosphere, bringing them through three different habitats. It's really fun really cold these days walking through that water, but I love it so much. And my favorite thing about these like is apple farts. And I have lived in Costa Rica, so I've been to the cloud forests there, and even though their flowers are so beautiful, all of their fauna, the epiphytes here in Florida still are my favorite. And don't get me wrong, flowers from all over the world are beautiful, as well as plants. We gift them to each other in times of celebration and sorrow. We plant them in our gardens and we invite them into our homes. But epiphytes are in a league of their own. So the term epiphyte that I keep referring to, that is an umbrella term for an organism that grows on another organism. So bromeliads, orchids, ferns, these are all types of epiphytes. And these are the main types we'll be taking a look at today. And if you were to break down the word epiphyte even further, you'd see that epi means on and phyte means plant. So it's an organism that grows on another plant. And these epiphytes and their host plant, they're in a commensalistic relationship. So the epiphytes are not harming their host plant, nor are they benefiting from it. They're kind of just hanging out on the side. And this host plant tends to be trees most of the time. But now that we have a general idea of what an epiphyte is, we're going to play a little game. Um, so before we start, though, I want to revisit those terms so that we have a good idea of what we're doing. So epiphytic is a plant that grows on another plant and takes in nutrients from the air. And then a terrestrial plant, like what we're probably most familiar with, is a plant that grows out of the ground and takes nutrients from the soil. And so since most of us have our cameras off, um, I'm thinking we could use the zoom reaction feature features for this. So if you want to raise your hand, if you think this plant is, or sorry, if you think this plant is epiphytic, and if you want to do a thumbs up, if you think it is terrestrial, 
that would work. So what's going to happen is we're going to go through a few different organisms and you're going to guess if they're epiphytic or terrestrial. And our first one is wax paper lichen. So if you want to go ahead and click your reactions at the bottom of your screen, you can access them right. Okay, so I'm seeing one person epiphytic. See if anyone else can get theirs in. All right. Well, we're looking like most of us think this one is epiphytic, and that is correct. We see this one is growing. This is some wax paper lichen growing on the side of some tree bark there. And then next we have our saw palmetto. And if you're raising your hand, you're going to have to unraise your hand and then do the thumbs up if you think it's uh, terrestrial. All right, looks like we think this one is terrestrial, and that is correct. We have hand fern. This one's very interesting. You see it growing out of a cabbage palm. All right. And this one is epiphytic. And then we have our morning glory, this flower here. And this morning glory is terrestrial. We see it growing out of the ground there in the background. And then we have the butterfly orchid. This one could be tricky. Epiphytic, yes. So this butterfly orchid is epiphytic, though we do have both terrestrial and epiphytic orchids here in the preserve. And we have our sable palm. So this is that tree that that hand fern was growing out of. All right, we think it's terrestrial. That's correct. We see it growing out of the ground right there. And then we have swamp lily, one of my favorite flowers here in the prairie. Okay. Terrestrial, yes, this one is terrestrial. And last but not least, we have the strangler fig. I see some sort of confused faces. <laughs> that is because this one is a trick question. So strangler figs are really cool. They can be both epiphytic and terrestrial, just not at the same time. So what happens is a bird will come along and eat the fig, that fruit we see there on the right, and then it will defecate the seeds which land in the canopy of a tree. And so the epiphyte's going to start its, or sorry, this strangler fig is going to start its life out as an epiphyte. So on the left, we see a strangler fig growing out of the crevice of a tree. But this tree, the strangler fig, wants to be terrestrial. So what it's going to do is it's going to work its roots down to the ground, which is what we see on the right. And once its roots do plant themselves into the soil, it is then terrestrial. And at this point, the strangler fig is starting to grow very rapidly. It's going to sprout leaves all over the place and its, its trunk is going to get thicker. And it's called a strangler fig because if we look back at this photo on the left, it wraps itself around its host tree. And that's where it lives. And strangler figs, when they're terrestrial, can harm their host if their host is too small, like a small, weak maple tree. But for the most part, the, the host tree just lives among the stranger fig. So that concludes our game. Good job, everybody. Now we're going to talk about what kinds of trees epiphytes like to grow on. So epiphytes are clinging on to the side of these trees, and they have clinging roots, which we'll see in a few slides. So they like really rough bark. So on the left, we have a cypress tree. In the middle, we have a cabbage palm with lots of nooks and crannies. And on the right, we have the bark from a live oak. So these are optimal trees for epiphytes to grow on. And even on the left, we see an air plant growing out off the side of that cypress tree. And here's an example. On the left, we have a royal palm. And royal palms have very smooth bark. And if you look on the right, we have a cabbage palm, which has lots of nooks and crannies for epiphytes to grow out of. So on the right, you see that there are a lot of epiphytes growing out of that cabbage palm, or sorry, not growing out of, but growing on the side of. And then royal palm doesn't have any epiphytes. Its bark is a bit too smooth. But 
epiphytes, you might expect to see them on the side of a tree or in the swamp, but because they aren't taking any nutrients from their host, they can really grow in anything as long as they have access to nutrients. So up in the top right corner, we see some ball moss growing on a power line. And if you were to drive down Tammy Annie Trail, you might see ball moss or an air plant growing on the power lines, which is amazing how they're able to find nutrients without any trees above them. And then on the bottom right, we see some lichen and some blood lichen growing on a boardwalk. So since they don't take any nutrients, they can pretty much grow anywhere, as long as the conditions are right. And if you took a walk through the Big Cypress Swamp, it would be difficult to find a place absent of epiphytes. There are ferns everywhere, hair plants on every tree, and orchids hiding among them. Now, when I'm standing in the swamp, I feel like I've been placed inside a Jurassic Park movie. And what gives this, the swamp this Jurassic feeling are the epiphytes. And you might compare these two from Jurassic Park as epiphytes hanging on for their dear life. And this is what they're using to hang on for dear life to our trees. These are called clinging roots. So these are from an orchid in particular. And then we'll take a look at some air plant clinging roots. And you'll notice these are visibly different. The air plant clinging roots have a bit of extra support there in the middle. And they need this extra support because they're heavy. And they're not heavy just because of their, their mass, but because of how much water they can hold. So some bromeliads, they're called tank bromeliads, have what's called a tank in the middle. So it's sort of like a water storage tank you might have at your house or your camper. And so in the middle here is where they'll store their water and they'll actually absorb this water through their leaves. And so these are their leaves. They're shaped sort of like a water slide. So if you remember when you were younger going to the water park, you went down these slides and the, the sides of them are sort of curved. And the air plant leaves are curved just like these water slides. And so our air plants, they have, our cardinal air plant in particular, has a water slide, if you will, and it also has a pool, which is its tank. So in the middle here, you see its tank and then its leaves are going right into it. So we've seen its leaves, we've seen its water slide, we've seen its pool, but there's something missing from this equation and that's us. So every now and then an air plant will get lucky and a dead bug will fall on its leaf. And then some rain will come along and wash that bug into its tank. And here's where that dead bug is going to decompose. And when it does, the air plant is going to absorb its nutrients through its leaves. And this is why they're called air plant, because they take in all their nutrients from the air. So they're getting nutrients from the water, from the sunlight, as well as decomposing needles and bugs that fall into their tanks. All right, so now we've seen the tank, we've seen the leaves, and we know how it gets its nutrients. I want to introduce you to the cardinal air plant. So the one on the left is near and dear to my heart. This is the cardinal air plant that I wake up to every morning. It's right outside my bedroom window. Unfortunately, the tornado that came through last week did knock it off the tree, but I'm trying to string it back up there because I love looking at them. They're really beautiful. And on the right, you can sort of see how big this is. So they can get up to two feet wide, but they can also be really, really small. So this is an air plant from our education trail where we bring the sixth graders on their field trips. And every time I'm out there, I always ask them to find the smallest air plant they can. So this is how they start out and then they grow to that much bigger size. And if you're thinking it looks like the top of a pineapple, you'd be right. Bromeliads, Pineapples are actually in the bromeliad family, so they're in the same family as the cardinal air plant. And another air plant that we have up here is the potbelly air plant. And you'll see this one's a bit more elongated. Its leaves don't go out right from the bottom, and the leaves are a bit more curved and sporadic. And so air plants are flowering plants. So on the right of this photo here, we see this pink part. This is called the brash. And this bract is where all of its seeds are stored. And at the very end of this bract is where its flower is going to be. And here we see the cardinal air plant bract on the left. It's very similar. 
And something very sad, in my opinion, about air plants is that they only flower once in their life. So once they flower, and the flower will be up for about two to three months, once their flower dies, the air plant itself is going to start dying over a one to two year process. So on the right, we see a dead air plant bract. And if you look below it, these leaves are starting to die. And so here are those flowers on the very end of that bract. You see the pollen there as well. So these get pollinated by animals like hummingbirds as well as bees. And then we have our southern needle leaf air plant, which isn't a tank for milliad. We see there's no spot for water to be stored. And so what southern needle leaves do, as well as all of our bromeliads, is they use their trichomes, which are these hair-like or scale-like things on the side of their leaves. They're coming out of their leaves. And these will trap water. So this is how they help absorb their nutrients. And something really cool about the southern needle leaf in particular is in the winter, when its host tree's leaves fall off because it's deciduous, say if they're growing on a cypress tree, for example, the southern needle leaf will start to create red pigment. And they do this sort of as a form of sunblock, if you will, because they're now exposed to all that extra sunlight and they don't like that. And here we have our ball moss. So we're going to be talking about two bromeliads today that are actually called mosses, but they aren't mosses at all. If you look closely at this ball moss, you can see it looks a little fuzzy. So those are those trichomes. And the ball moss is what we saw growing on the power line a few slides earlier. So ball moss is a little sporadic, it's sort of just growing in on itself all over the place. And our other moss that isn't actually a moss, it's a bromeliad, is Spanish moss. So Spanish moss grows in these long, wispy strands. And if you were to look at it up close, you would notice it's trichomes, it's sort of fuzzy. And they have these really small, beautiful flowers because all of our bromeliads are flowering plants. And something that gets mistaken for Spanish moss a lot, even by me in the beginning, is old man's beard. So this isn't actually a bromeliad, this one is a lichen. And the easiest way for me to tell the difference when I'm out in the swamp is by the texture, this one is more rough than the Spanish moss, and old man's beard grows more in clumps while the Spanish moss grows in those long wispy strands. And this is my favorite lichen that we have here. So on the top right, we have the wax paper lichen, and on the bottom left, we have blood lichen. So blood lichen is really cool. It's actually an indicator of a healthy environment. So if you're out in the swamp and you see blood lichen, that lets you know that that's a really good environment. It's very healthy, it's very rich. So now we're moving on to maybe some people's favorite type of epiphytes are orchids. And I'm wondering how many people knew before today that vanilla is an orchid. I learned this just a few months ago when I was developing this program. And so these pods you see on the right, those are where you get your vanilla beans. We see them dried up on the left. And this orchid right here is the orchid of the flower, of the vanilla plant. And so some, some orchids you might be more familiar with are these ones. You might see them in Trader Joe's or Lowe's when you get go shopping. These are pretty common for house plants. But the orchids we're going to be talking about today in Big Cypress, you're not going to find in a grocery store. They're really cool. Not that these ones aren't cool. I have one sitting next to me at the moment, actually. But our first one we're going to be talking about today is the cow horn orchid. So the name of this orchid is cow horn. So I had Ranger Ella Simon Photoshop the orchid onto the horn of the cow for a little comedic effect. I hope I got a few laughs out of that one. I love this photo personally. And so here is the cow horn up close though. And on the left, you'll see its seeds. So both our bromeliads and our orchids are reproducing via seeds. And this orchid's very beautiful and it's huge. It's not just one flower, it's this whole stem and strand of flowers. And so those clinging roots we saw earlier, this is a huge system of clinging roots. So you'll see on the right, this is an old set of roots from the cow horn orchid. 
and the cow market is no longer there. It's now being taken over by Golden Polypod Fern. You can see growing out of the top of it. So this one is huge. It has really large leaves. Now I want to talk about one that's really small. So this is our Jingle Bell Orchid. And if you take a look at your pinky fingernail, see how small it is. This orchid, the flower of it, is less than half the size of your pinky fingernail. They are tiny. So you see here all those clingy roots, those things that look like wet spaghetti. They're no bigger than an inch or two around. So if you're walking through the swamp, you might not even notice this one. And so here, those yellow parts you see there, that's not even the flower, that's actually the seed pod. The flower is even smaller than that. So these are just tiny. And you can see the epiphytes living together. So you see some lichen here, you see some moss all over the clinging roots of this jingle belt orchid. And this orchid doesn't have any leaves. So normally a plant would photosynthesize through its leaves. But since this orchid does not have any, what it's going to do is photosynthesize through its clinging roots. So its roots in this case are not only absorbing its nutrients, but it's also um, photosynthesizing. And another, oh, sorry. And this is the pollinator possibly of it. Scientists aren't entirely sure who the pollinator of this one is, but since it's so small, the flower, they think that the mosquito actually could be the pollinator of it. And I didn't know until a few months ago that mosquitoes could even be pollinators. I thought they were just a bother when I was outside, but they actually can pollinate a few different flowers. They're really cool. And another leafless orchid that we have is the famous ghost orchid, which you may have heard of before. And so this is also photosynthesizing through its roots, absorbing all of its nutrients. And the pollinator of this one, there's only two that they know of. They used to think, scientists used to think that only the giant sphinx moth was the pollinator of it, because if you look at the end of the moth, it has this long proboscis. And if you look at the ghost orchid, right above the proboscis, you see this long nectar tube. So the giant sphinx moth will put it, the proboscis in the nectar tube so that it gets the nectar and the pollen will rub off on the nose. And then the idea is it will go visit other ghost orchids and pollinate with that pollen on its nose. Now they're realizing that the fake sphinx moth also is a pollinator. So it's a very similar moth. But this proboscis on this moth is actually a little bit shorter, so it's better to it can it's better to get that pollen on the nose. So this moth, the giant sphinx moth, its proboscis was a little too long. It wasn't always getting that pollen on its nose. But the fig sphinx moth, its proboscis is just the perfect length that it's getting that nectar, and it's also transferring pollen from orchid to orchid. And here we see the seed pod of a ghost orchid. So again, our orchids are producing via seeds, but that's not the only way that our epiphytes can reproduce, which leads us to our next group of epiphyte ferns. And ferns, they're not reproducing with seeds, but with spores. So these circles you hear, if you focus on just one circle and you look inside it, there's clumps. Those clumps aren't actually the spores, they're clumps of spores. So these spores are really small. You can't even really see them with the naked eye. And so our ferns, if you look on the back of them during certain times of the year, you'll see it's their spores just hanging out on the back of the fern. And ferns are so old. If I asked you to draw a photo of a fern, you might draw one that looks like this. This is a pretty common fern. And they're so old, we have fossils of them. They're actually so old that they predate the dinosaurs. So they're over 360 million years old. And it's crazy that throughout all that time, the shapes of the ferns haven't really changed all that much. We still see ferns that look like that fossil or the ones on the right of this diagram here today. And these, this diagram shows the complexity of ferns. So ferns can be either really complex, like the one on the right, or they can be really simple, like the one on the left. And the ones we're going to start looking at today are the simple ones, which the first one being strap fern. So this strap fern 
looks just like its name, just a long strap. And it can get about two and a half to three feet long, or it can be shorter. And this is a simple fern. If you look at it, it's not, there aren't indents going into the middle stem there. And this on the right is those spores. So this is the same exact fern that Ranger Joseph took a photo of as that left fern. So you see just how small those spores are, because remember, these circles aren't the spores, there's those clusters of clusters of spores. And that brings us to our next simple fern. This is shoestring fern. It's very interesting. It looks like somebody just took a clump of grass and threw it up onto a tree, but it really is a fern. And on the back, so on the left, we'll see that hand fern at the very top that we saw during the game earlier. And then we'll see the shoestring shoe fern just below it, mixed in with some golden polypody fern on the bottom. So you see just how they're living together on this one tree. And here are its spores. This is how we know it's a fern. It has its spores right on the back. And this one's interesting. They're just in lines. They're clusters of lines on the back because this fern is so thin. It's about half an inch thick or wide. Now we're getting into more complex ferns. So this is that golden polypody fern that I mentioned was in the bottom of that photo. These ones can get really long, two to three feet long, three quarters of a foot wide. These are one of my favorite ferns that we have in the swamp. Here's a look at those beautiful spores on the back. And these are going to get either rinsed off by the rain or blown off by the wind. And that's how they're going to reproduce. And this is, okay, I lied. This is my favorite fern actually. This is resurrection fern. And it's called resurrection fern because if you look on the right side of the photo, at the very top, this fern looks dead. But it's not dead. It just hasn't had access to water or rainfall in a little while. So what it does is it's going to shrivel up to minimize its surface area exposed to the elements. And then once water comes along, it's all happy and it'll sprout up to a big green a uh, healthy looking fern again, like we see here on the left or even on the bottom of that photo on the right. And I say big fern, but they're really only one to three inches long and they grow in clumps like this. So you'll see them a lot of times if you see like a horizontal branch out in the swamp, they'll be covered with resurrection fern. And here's a look at those spores. You see on the bottom right that some of those spores have already gone away and the ones on the top are still hanging on. So this is the most complex fern we're going to be taking a look at today. Now I want to talk about how ferns and orchids and bromeliads and all our epiphytes are used by animals, why they're important in the swamp. So here we have a snake slithering along a fern. You might see a deer eating a fern or perhaps a rabbit as well. And then caterpillars. Caterpillars love munching on things. Here we see it sitting behind an air plant. This one's dead, but perhaps there's one, a live one that it was munching on just above this one. And then fox squirrels. We see it here with some Spanish moss. So fox squirrels are really interesting. They will not only eat air plants, specifically cardinal air plants, but they'll put their nests in them. So they build their nests in these air plants, usually a really big one, and they'll have their babies there. And then ants. Ants are in a mutualistic relationship with this cardinal air plant here. So this cardinal air plant is providing the ants with home, with shelter, and the air plant, the ants will actually bring the air plant home food, if you will. So they'll bring home clippings of a leaf or clippings of a flower, and they'll store it in the air plant where it's going to decompose and the air plant is going to absorb its nutrients. So oftentimes when I'm outside and I pick up air plants, I have to be wary because I know that there's probably ants in them and I don't want them crawling over my hand. <laughs> and then we have anoles. This is that bract, this pink part of that cardinal air plant we saw earlier. Anoles will just hang out on them, perhaps hiding from a predator as well as this green tree frog we see here, just hanging out on the leaf of a cardinal air plant. And then frogs will also use lichen. 
So I have a funny story about this photo here. So I presented this program multiple times to my peers over the months. And while developing this program, I spent weeks staring at this photo. And I used to stay, say, and I will say today, how great of camouflage this clump of lichen would be for this frog up here in the top right. If he was just an inch lower, you would, might not even be able to see him there if you were a predator. It took me weeks to notice that there was a second frog in this photo. So if you look in the bottom right, just on top of the lichen, it's actually camouflaged with the lichen. It took me so long to notice it. So that proves my point, I guess, that the frogs can use lichen to hide from predators. So another way that these epiphytes are supporting the lives of animals here. And then this guy, so this is a really large snake in an air plant that's probably a little too small for him. Uh, not nearly as common a sight as those other animals, but you might find a smaller snake, like a black racer in your air plant if you're walking by it. Perhaps he's hiding from a predator that he thinks can't climb this tree. So just another way those air plants are supporting the lives of these animals. And if you took air plants and ferns and orchids, all our epiphytes away, you might start to see a decline in the animals that depend on them, that use them for food. So it's important that we conserve not only the epiphytes, but also the environment they live in, so the cypress swamp typically. And someone who does a really good job of that is Clyde Butcher. So Clyde Butcher is a black and white photographer here in Big Cypress, and he's pretty famous in the area. Some people even call him the Ansel Adams of Big Cypress. And so has anyone been on a hiking trail, a hiking, a hike before? Just imagine that hike you were on and how difficult it was, all those roots you were tripping on. Now imagine doing that hike through waist deep water, holding this huge camera. It'd be really hard, but that's exactly what Clyde did for years. And he captured some really beautiful photos when he was out there. So this is my favorite photo of his. This is called Cigar Orchid Pond. And we see all the epiphytes here on the right. We have some ferns. We have some air plants on the left. Those are really everywhere. And there's probably some orchids hiding among them. Those are definitely more difficult to find. And so what Clyde is doing by taking these photos and why he's a conservationist is because he's helping people fall in love with the swamp. You look at this photo and you're like, wow, those air plants and those ferns are beautiful. I don't want those to go away. I want to help conserve them. So he's an activist in a way. And just by sharing his art, he's helping protect the swamp. And there's a really beautiful quote I'd like to share. It's by Baba Diom. It goes, in the end, we can serve only what we love. We love only what we understand. We understand only what we are taught. So conservation is a team effort. Rangers at national parks inform the public on a topic to help them better understand it. And then once they understand it, then conservationists like Clyde Butcher help them fall in love with the swamp and its epiphytes. And like Bapa Diom said, we conserve only what we love. But anyone can teach someone about their favorite topic. You don't have to be a really famous person like Clyde Butcher. So if you really love epiphytes or anything really, share your knowledge or experiences with someone. And maybe that person will also fall in love with that topic and you can work together to conserve it. So some things that we can do is support our lo your local national park. You might not be a local to Big Cypress, but we have a national park unit, at least one in every state. And we're all protecting our natural resources within our boundaries. Or be an advocate, stand up for what you believe in. Invite friends and families into nature. Again, if you're not a local and you can't come to the swamp, find your favorite spot in nature and just bring your friends and family there because the best way to fall in love with something is to be immersed in it. Or if you can't get out into nature, you could donate to a cause. The South Florida Orchid Society is a society down here in Florida that protects orchids. 
Or if you're an artist like Clyde Butcher, or even if you just have a cell phone and can snap a photo, share photos of your favorite thing out in nature. Show people the beauty of it so that they can fall in love with it and conserve it as well. And like Baba Diom said, the best way to increase conservation efforts for something we love is to help others understand it and fall in love with it as well. So I challenge you all today when you go home to invite friends and family on a walk through your favorite place in nature, whether it be in Florida or your home state. Share your knowledge of epiphytes and whatever your favorite part of nature may be with them. And if you do decide to go on a swamp walk, if you're nearby, see how many epiphytes you can identify. The next time you see a tree frog, a deer, or a small snake, perhaps you'll think back to today and remember how epiphytes contribute to their survival. But before we go, I would like to offer you all a little taste of the swamp. So up in a second, I'll be playing a 50 second video of a walk through the swamp with some nature sounds in the background. Thank you. Have you observed any interactions between birds and epiphytes? I'm usually out in the swamp with like 15 sixth graders that are really loud, so all the animals tend to run away from us. <laughs> um, unfortunately, I haven't seen any hummingbirds pollinated them, but this is the season for the air plants, the cardinal air plants to bloom. So I've noticed out in the swamp, there's a lot of those red bracts. They haven't quite flowered yet, but I'm hoping once they flower, I'll see more hummingbirds visiting them to pollinate. I have a favorite epiphyte from each group of epiphytes. Um, honestly though, I think the cardinal air plant. It was the first one that I really knew was an epiphyte when I first got here. So we had epiphytes in Costa Rica when I was at the cloud forest um, and they had tank bromeliads that looked a little bit different, but that was the first thing that I recognized when I got here. And I didn't know much about Florida before I got here. I didn't even know there was a swamp. And so right when I saw that, I was like, oh my gosh, I know what that is. I know something about the state. <laughs> so that's probably my favorite. <laughs> It's amazing how much you have learned about Florida and Big Cypress in the short time that you've been here. I've learned a lot, yeah, it's been great. I see in the chat, I haven't seen personally, thank God, uh, much evidence of the Mexican bromeliad weevil here. So the Mexican bromeliad weevil will eat the air plants and they'll get knocked off the trees, it goes sort of right through them. Um, so I know of the issue, I've heard of it, but luckily I personally haven't seen any evidence of it yet. Well, thank you, Danielle, so much. Really impressed with your presentation, and I think you have a very bright future as a park ranger. Thank you. I had a lot of fun joining. I'm glad you all enjoyed. I hope you come back to see all the other programs Naples Preserve has for you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a good one. Yep. Everybody have a great day. Thanks again.